Welcome back to Swiss Watch King. Today we had a great opportunity to come to New York City, visit my good friend, Instagram famous new NYC watch guy. Many of you guys know him by his wide range of watches from complications and brands and also is very famous for his watch memes. Today we are here with Vas. How are you man? Nice to see you. Good to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having us in your beautiful office in New York City and thank you for bringing all the watches. So <laughs> Vas, tell us something about, about yourself. Yeah, I, well I, I grew up in India. Um, you know, middle class family didn't have a lot of money uh, you know we had we had enough to eat we had uh, basic luxuries but a watch was not one of those basic luxuries and uh, in in indian society in general you know luxuries are are not really something that you get uh, unless you're you're very wealthy and so i was always someone who would try to go to the the local bazaar and try to find an old broken g-shock or a stolen g-shock that had come from china and i would i would buy this watch for probably a couple dollars i'd wear it for a couple of weeks uh, and then it would probably break and then my dad still tells me to this day that i would go and try to sell the broken watch to somebody and try to make some money off of it so i guess i've been i've been selling shit to people since i was you know five seven years old um, but i basically came to the u.s for college um, went to Penn in Philadelphia and sort of that was at my senior year of college was when my my sort of small obsession for watches really started throughout college I think I would buy more digital stuff I would buy a Casio uh, atomic watch that could connect to the atomic uh, clock in in somewhere in Colorado so it was always very precise um, I think the, the thing that that, obs that I was obsessed with the most about watches was the indiglo light uh, so having a watch that had a, a, a small blue light in it was the coolest thing in the world to me and I never really thought about mechanical watches um, at, at all like I, I didn't even realize the extent to which mechanical watches existed in the world what the price points could be none of this I mean if you told me that the most expensive watch in the world was five thousand dollars when I was in college I would have believed you and said that makes sense I don't know who's crazy enough to spend five thousand dollars on a watch um, but that's you know that's that's how the whole thing started it started with digital watches uh, G-Shocks Casios and then Slowly, I, I started to get a little bit more sophisticated, I guess, and refined in my taste. Perfect. And times have definitely changed. Times have changed. And now you know it, the 5K is not the most expensive watch. <laughs> Perfect. So we have a very wide range here from you. Let's start with maybe the, the first piece. What's the... Yeah, so this was the first watch, uh, really, that I ever bought um, that was... Uh, sort of an analog watch, if you will. Uh, this was my senior year in college. It was uh, Black Friday, as you know, here in the US is the, the biggest shopping day of the year. So I was 21 years old um, and I was uh, trying, to, trying to impress a girl and she was not there. She went away that weekend and I ended up going to, uh, to Macy's in Philadelphia with a girl that I had dated in high school and uh, another girl uh, that was uh, that was also in college with me and so we we all go to the three of us go to Macy's and my plan had been that I was gonna buy a watch to impress this other girl that I was trying to start dating and I'm looking through the Macy's you know windows and you know it's mostly fashion brands there they don't really have any any high-end stuff and I, I saw this Movado and again at this time I don't even know the difference between quartz yeah, yeah. and mechanical <laughs> I just saw this and I said that's an amazing watch. It looks good. And my ex who was who was there with me from high school, she was like, that's an awesome watch. You should buy that. So and it was it was twelve hundred dollars for a quartz Movado. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I've never spent twelve hundred dollars on anything. How the hell am I going to afford this watch? So I'm literally on my phone looking for coupon codes. And I find like a, a three, four hundred dollar off coupon code plus a Black Friday sale. Plus, they said if you sign up for a Macy's credit card, you will get an additional 15 percent off. So I sign up for everything at the store. And I think I ended up paying like 750 or 800 for this watch, which was still the most expensive thing I've ever bought in my life. Um, and then I wore this every day from 2008 till 2011, literally every day of the year I, I wore this. I mean, you can see the, the bracelet is scuffed and it's, I, the crazy part is I think I only replaced the battery one time in this watch um, and, and that was it. And it ran for, for four years. Four years. 
I would never wear this watch ever again. It looks ridiculous on my wrist. It's like 45 millimeters, um, but I'll never sell this watch either because heavy it was, well, and it's real heavy, <laughs> but I'll never sell this watch because it was the first one that I ever bought with sort of my own money. Of course, and again, like at that time, that was a lot of money when you were back in college. Yep. But it's still kind of cool though. You know? It is, it's cool. It's, it's a cool watch. It's the beginning, it's the beginning for sure. Chronograph and everything, nice. So what's the what's what's this boy right here? So after the Movado that I wore for three years, um, I was it was 2011. I didn't have I still didn't have a lot of money. I was running my my startup at the time, so didn't have much money at all. But was you know at least at least making a living and able to pay my bills. And I saw a an ad in a in a magazine for a Zenith. And I remember seeing this watch, and again, at this point, I still don't know anything about any watch brand, really. I've heard of Rolex, and that's really it. And I see uh, an ad for Zenith, and I'm like, wow, that, that's a really, really cool watch. I wonder what that is. So I do a little bit of research, and obviously the ad that I saw was for a watch that was $150,000. Uh, so I couldn't afford that. But I found this Zenith El Primero Chronomaster with this open face dial. And I just, I, I, was, I was just taken. I was like, wow, you can see the insides of a watch. I've, I never thought that that was possible. So I decided that this is the watch that I need to try to find. And it was about a six or $7,000 watch at the time. Uh, I, I did not have six or $7,000 to spend on a watch. So I said, okay, I need to find this watch pre-owned. Um, so I look all over New York. At the time, you know, Chrono 24 wasn't really that big. Uh, in 2011. I don't even know if it existed, frankly, in 2011. I go on eBay, but people had told me, oh, you can't really trust watches on eBay. You never know. And because I didn't know anything about watches, I was scared to buy a couple thousand dollar watch on eBay. What happens if it's fake and I can't find out that it's fake? So I look at all the stores, nothing exists. I'm on my way to Italy um, for, uh, for a basketball event for my company. And I decide, okay, maybe in Italy, because I'd heard Italy was a great place for watches, I was like, maybe in Rome, I'll be able to find this watch. So prior to leaving, I go on Google Maps and I mark every single watch store in Rome. And so I fly to Rome, my girlfriend's with me, and as we're traveling, as we're walking around Rome sightseeing, somehow magically, every 15 to 20 minutes, a watch store appears. And my girlfriend, after the fourth, after the fourth watch store, she's like, wow, there's a lot of watch stores in Rome, huh? Suspicious. I'm like, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you, May I guess so. <laughs> so every store I go into, I'm like, hey, do you have a Zenith? Nobody has a Zenith. Few stores carried it, didn't have this exact, exact model, definitely did not have this dial. Um, and this was the one I wanted. So finally, after a full day of walking around Rome, we've, I've basically given up. The girlfriend's pissed off at me at this point. She's like, I can't believe you, you, you told me we're going sightseeing and instead we've been watch shopping all day. So we're on the way back to the hotel. It's boiling hot, it's the middle of summer and there's an old jewelry store that we spot. And I say, you know what, it's hot. Let's just go inside, get some air conditioning. So we walk into this old jewelry store. It's all diamonds and, and necklaces. There are no watches anywhere. I just, as I'm standing in the door inside the store, I asked the old woman, I'm like, hey, do you have any watches? She goes, uh, yeah, I have like four watches that, that I you know, bought on trade or something. They're in my safe. I'm like, oh, cool, can I see them? She comes out, opens the roll. In the roll, in a jewelry store, is this watch. No box, no papers, just the watch. And, and, and I'm just, I'm shocked. I was like, after this whole day of searching in the store that doesn't even sell watches, is the watch that I want. Um, and so at that point, you know, you're like, it's fate. God wants me to have this watch. That's what you tell yourself. So I think I negotiated for like $3,000, which was to me, again, the most money I'd ever spent on anything in my life. Uh, but it was the watch and it, it was sort of like, you can't not buy this watch at this point because yeah. it's here. Uh, so I ended up buying this watch again, like I said, no box, no papers, but I bought it anyway. Um, and someone had told me that the way to find out if the watch is real is you hold it up to your ear and you listen to the beats. And so I'm standing in the store like an idiot, not knowing what I'm doing. And I'm like, and I tell my girlfriend, I'm like, I think it's real. We're good. And, and, and I bought the watch. Yeah. And so this is another watch that again, I don't really wear it anymore. Um, just because you know, the, the collection has stuff that 
is is I guess better than than this, but this will always be sort of my start to watch collecting, and, and so it's a watch that I can never sell ever again. But it's, it's a good a, start, uh, for sure. It's not yeah, bad. Yeah, it's start. not bad. El Primero is in it. You know, it's Classic. it's as good as it gets. I think uh, we all did uh, this at one point <laughs> <laughs> to see if a watch is real or the sweeping seconds. Right. Or right. <laughs> so I see you have uh, like a wide range of brands, like I said before. Here, Movado, Zenit, and uh, see also an Omega. What's your fascination with uh, with the Speedmaster? So I'll be honest. The 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 Snoopy, which is what you have there, was was bought because of the hype. When it first came out, I didn't even think twice yeah. about it. I said, ah, just another Speedmaster limited edition, no big deal. And I blame Red Bar for this because <laughs> uh, I'm a, I'm a big Red Bar New York guy. I'm there, you know, at least. 15, 20 times a year on Wednesday nights, I'm there. And and Adam Craniotis, who, run, who started Red Bar, has a Snoopy. And I would keep seeing this Snoopy every week it would be there. And you know, the cool part about the Snoopy really, right, is, is it's all about the loom. So, yeah. you know, the, the, the thing about Red Bar is you people come with, with their loom sticks and then you do this <laughs> yeah, yeah. and you and you're just looking, you're like, oh my God, okay. that's so cool. <laughs> I need that. <laughs> and so I think of all the watches out there in the world, as far as execution of loom goes, I don't think anyone's done it better than Omega on the Snoopy. And so I, I sort of ended up buying this watch um, because of the loom factor more than anything else. And I never would have even known about the loom if I hadn't been to Red Bar and seen this watch 30 times uh, on, on the table. And so again, I don't, I don't really wear this one that much, but every couple of months I open up the safe and I do this with the, with the loom and I just look at it and it's, it's the coolest thing in the world. You fulfill your need basically. Exactly. <laughs> well, no, it's really cool. Many of our uh, followers and um, viewers say that the Speedmaster is the ultimate watch you need. So I think... Uh, I think having at least one is, a, is, is definitely a good thing in a collection. And, and oftentimes when, you know, I, I've now become sort of my go-to guy for all my friends when it comes to watches. And when someone says, hey Vas, I'm like getting ready to buy my first watch. Um, what should I get? You know, I'd say the Speedmaster is yeah. right there as one of my first options for them. I also, you know, say a Tudor yeah. Black Bay is a, is a good starting point for you and probably a Nomos, um, which sort of, you know, we also have a Nomos here, which if you had asked me, you know, two, three years ago, would I buy a Nomos? I would have said, you know what? I think my collection has sort of outgrown Nomos at this point. I don't know that I would buy one. But this watch, I think, is a very, very special piece that was made uh, for Wempy here in, in New York City when they first launched uh, in the U.S. And it's, you know, it, it's, I'm, I'm a sucker for World Time watches. I love World Time watch. I think there's something romantic yeah. about having all these different countries on a dial. And thinking about them. And, and thinking about going there, right? And you're like, oh, I, you, you look at these names and you go, okay, I've been to like these five countries. <laughs> I almost want to go to these places yeah. just to be able to land in that country <laughs> the and watch. press the button and say, I'm in that country now. It's, it's something so cool yeah. about world timers. And, and so when I saw this, there's two cool things about this Nomos glass uh, uh, world timer. You know, one is it says New York for home time. And you know, I'm now a, an adopted New Yorker. I've been here for 11 years, but also, you know, my, my handle is NYC watch guy. So I, I felt like I have to have one watch that yes. says New York on it. But then for the time zone for New York, it says Fifth Avenue, yeah. which I don't know that there's any other watch in the world that I've found that actually has the words Fifth Avenue on it, which I thought was very cool. And so, you know, to me, this is the ultimate New York City watch. Uh, and so despite the rest of the collection, um, last year I ended up being able to pick up uh, one of these still from, from Wempy. I think it may have been their last piece that they had. And, um, and, and so I'm, I'm really, really excited about this piece. I wear it when, whenever I'm traveling. This is sort of my, my go-to watch for the, for the plane ride there. I don't tend to wear it once I land, but for the airplane ride, this is my go-to watch. It's beautiful and Nomos has a great value proposition, right? Oh, for the price, I mean, as an entry level starting point for anyone, it is, I, I, I struggle to find a better option for anyone than, than Nomos. I can agree with you on that. So then you got, let's say, a little bit obsessed with the <laughs> I <laughs> did get Geneva. very obsessed with Universal Geneva. <laughs> Definitely, I have to blame Hodinki uh, and, and Ben Clymer for this one. Um, he started writing about this, I think, you know, probably 2000, I want to say like 2000, 
2012, 2013 was when he sort of first started writing about these watches. And at the time, like, I didn't know anything about vintage. I, I was sort of, you know, Zenith. Uh, I had bought a Glashute original, Panamatic Lunar. That was sort of my first, like, big purchase. And, and I didn't know much about vintage, but what I started to realize was I had this itch to keep collecting, but buying modern watches is very expensive. Yeah. And you know, I didn't have much money. There's only so much that you can buy when it comes to modern, but with vintage, there's, you know, there's a couple things. One, you can always find a good deal if you search hard enough. Two, th there's, there's the search itself. Like the search itself, I think is, is, half, the, is half the fun. Yeah. Um, and so I sort of got the itch for vintage and the watch that got me sort of into it was Universal Geneva. And actually this was the first one that I ever bought uh, from a dealer in Mexico City. And you know, it came, I had, had no idea if it was gonna be real or broken. Did this. I did that, it worked. <laughs> um, and so I've, you know, it's like an oversized tri-compax, sort of 36 millimeter, which a lot of these tend to be like 33, 34. And, and for me, you know, I don't buy any watches that I don't wear myself. So I'll never buy a 33, 34 millimeter watch because it's not about just collecting, it's about actually wearing everything that you buy. And so the fact that this was like a 35, 36 millimeter watch that I could actually wear was really awesome. You can see the, uh, the calendar on this is actually in Spanish, so it's not even yes. in uh, it's not even in English, which I don't think I even realized when I bought it. And the song I was like, "Wait a minute, is this fake? Like, what are these what are these names inside these windows?" And it turned out it's yeah. a Spanish calendar. But then you know, from there, sort of the Nina was my holy grail. This was the watch that I wanted for the longest time from Universal Geneve, and the prices just skyrocketed. Yeah. By the time I started collecting UGs, I got in right as it was going this way. And this watch had already skyrocketed to like thirty, forty thousand dollars on in auctions, and I was like, "There's, there's no way I'm gonna spend that much money on on a vintage watch." And so, you know, UG has sort of flattened and it's sort of gotten a little soft. And I've spent basically the last five to six years just searching, searching, searching for for UGs at auction uh, on Chrono, on eBay, from random dealers, like wherever I can look for a Universal Geneva, I look for one, and I, I've gotten really lucky in that. I've paid well below market value for just about every UG that I've bought. Um, and, and the cool thing I think with UGs is the, is the way you can play with the straps. Yeah, sure. um, for me, this was the closest thing to a Rolex Daytona 6263 yeah. without it being a Rolex. And I'm not a Rolex guy. I've never bought a Rolex other than I did once buy a 6263. But other than that, I've never bought a Rolex and I never will. I'll never buy a modern Rolex. Um, I appreciate what they do. I think they're amazing watches. It's an amazing brand. But for me, um, I think of watches as pieces of art. Yeah. And when you make a million pieces a year, it can no longer yeah. be art. Like at that point, it's a commodity. It's not an art for me. And so that's why, you know, generally when you see the stuff that I buy, they tend to be independents. Yeah. Um, guys who are making anywhere from 20 pieces a year up to maybe 100 pieces a year, generally. Um, and to me, those guys are artisans and they're really making art. They're not mass producing stuff yeah. the way someone like Rolex might. And again, Rolex is the best business on earth. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't wanna knock them in any way. I think they're a great brand. It's just, it's not for me. And so the cool part about, I think, UG is they're n you're never gonna make any more UGs ever again. Yes. Um, and I think the design that they had in the 1960s it's just, it's so amazing that these watches were made in, in the 60s. Even to this day in, in 2020, I don't know that anyone's making such cool designs uh, on chronographs, like the big eye here. Um, it's, it's just so cool to have this asymmetric design between the, the sub-registers, which I don't know anyone who's really doing stuff like that today. Nah, that's super cool. What's your favorite out of these UGs, if you could pick one? Um, I still, I, I probably still have to just go back to the Nina. I think the the classic Panda dial um, with uh, with these three occasion. little, with, with every occasion, like whether it's on a suit, whether it's casual, and then the, the fact that you can just swap out these straps so easily and make them look so funky. 
Um, I, I, I just, I love, I love playing with the straps on these things. I'm, I'm changing the straps constantly. Even if I don't wear these very often, I just like to go in and I like to change the straps and take a quick picture for Instagram. Um, so that, this is still probably my favorite, but I do think that the, I think the best watch that UG made in that time was this evil Clapton with the, with sort of the four sub registers, um, a moon phase up there chronograph it's it's just so awesome and then these sort of curved lugs that they use yeah. man I, I, there's just yeah. something about UG it's it's just I think it's the best vintage brand that unfortunately didn't make it out of the quartz crisis yeah. um, I, I wonder what would have happened to that brand if they had somehow survived and Imagine had it. been able to make some modern stuff as listen, well listen listen the way the brand's going maybe in the future maybe something might come up maybe we'll never know that's right so we spoke all about the the the, the first watches you bought the Universal Genese which have a wide variety here but you also mentioned independence and you, your love for them, which we can clearly see on your Instagram page. We have a few special pieces here now, and I would like to start with uh, this boy right here. If you could explain to our viewers what this is. Oh, yeah, that is, so, so Jorn was probably one of the, it was the first independent brand that I really fell in love with. Um, I think what he's done, sort of his unique designs, what he does with the movements, being able to craft them out of, out of gold is, is awesome. And um, the watch that I thought was the most unique that he had ever made was this Octa Calendrier, which is an annual calendar. But the coolest part, I think, is sort of this retrograde date that he does in, in almost a semicircle yeah. or, or along the outside edge of the watch. And of all the things he's made, you know, the chronometer blue and all the hype around that yeah. these days, um, the tourbillons are amazing. But as far as something that's somewhat affordable, uh, but still incredibly unique, it's to me, it's this watch. And again, like being able to play with the straps yes. on a Jorn, like this is, this is a watch from the Amsterdam watch company that I picked up in Amsterdam. And it really, just changes the look of this watch completely because most Jorns come on like a very traditional croc or alligator strap. Yeah. And this makes it look like such a, such a casual watch. Um, I just, you know, the off center dial, the, the, the work inside of that, the fact that it's so usable and probably the coolest thing about this, the thing I hate the most about perpetual calendars and annual calendars is that if you don't keep them on a winder, yeah. you, you, you open your safe, you know, two months later and all of a sudden you're like, you gotta go find a, <laughs> a pusher to change the date or you sit here and you're like this, right? He made an annual calendar with no pushers. Everything is controlled through the crown, that's it. So if I wanna change the month, if I wanna change the day, the date, and the time, everything through this just based on how far you pull it out and the position, and then you move it. And so to me, this is the most usable annual calendar in the world because of the fact that there are no pushers because who has a pushpin with them wherever they go? You, you never have a pushpin yeah. with you. No matter, like when, who the hell carries a pushpin with them? Goldberger probably. Yeah. <laughs> he has one for sure. Or you have to use a toothpick or something. Right. Something like that. <laughs> And the movements of Jordan watches are just... I mean, yeah. to, to do that, I, I don't even know what it takes to do that, but to, I have to assume that to do that in pure gold is absolutely crazy. Yeah, for sure. It's not an easy feat, for sure. And the rotor, it's like beautifully decorated. I mean... It's amazing. It's, it's a great watch, for sure. And like you said, when you, as soon as you just change the strap color, it's a completely new watch, yep. basically. Yep. MBNF here. What's, what's the story behind this watch? To me, uh, what Max and, and, and MBNF do um, is the pinnacle of coolness. Like if you asked me of all the watch brands in the world, from the Richemont brands to the Swatch Group brands to the independents, what is the one watch that you can wear in any situation and you will not get any shit for it? Like you will always be seen as the coolest motherfucker yeah. in the room. This is the watch. It's MBNF. Um, it's it's just so crazy. Like who who's crazy enough to come up with these designs and have a curved crystal like this, and then have Kari come in and finish the movements? It's nuts. And so, I, this was of of all the crazy stuff that I saw in the watch world early on. MBNF was the one that just captured my imagination. And I said one day. Uh, I have to own an MBNF, 
and I was lucky enough, they've now discontinued the LM1 series completely, but I managed to pick up one of these LM1s uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and this is one of those watches that I would, I would never ever get rid of, I think. Yeah. It, because like I said, it's whether you wear it with watch guys, yeah. whether you watch it to a watch, whether you wear it to a watch event, whether you're at SIHH, whether you're just with a bunch of friends that don't know anything about watches or whether you're in a business meeting, like, it's not a Richard Meal. Yeah. It's not a Rolex. It's not the stuff that people kind of know. AP. But but they see that everybody who sees me wearing that watch, they're like, "What the hell is that?" Like, <laughs> dude, it looks like you have a UFO on your yeah. wrist, and it's so cool. And and it's not like a multi hundred thousand dollar watch. Like, it's not. It's it's you can you can afford this watch if you if you sell a couple other pieces in your collection. Yeah. You can buy this watch and it's it's the coolest thing you'll ever own. What they do is just astonishing. And like you said, the way they finish the movement with Kari's health is oh. the dot, dot on the eye, yeah, it's, it's crazy. And the, the sapphire crystal I realize now on the back is almost like non-existent. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you can barely tell that there's anything like, that you, you almost want to just yeah, put your finger in and touch the balance wheel. Like, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> not beautiful. And the floating balance wheel, I mean, you can look at this thing like everything you put it on, it's probably like a, puts a smile on your and, face. And the, the, I think the power reserve is also just yeah. such a cool piece of this, like the vertical power reserve. And the double dial and everything. So good. Nice, beautiful. And here we have also something many of my followers saw a couple of times this year. It's the logical one. Yes. By Roman Gauthier, one of my grail watches. He, what they're doing as well, I think it's just it's in the independent world. They're yeah. they're right there at the top, along with the MBNFs of the world. Um, you know, the fact that there's a, a pusher to wind this watch, I think, is is really cool. Uh, something that's unique, something that nobody has ever done before, as far as I know. Movement finishing is is incredible. It's lightweight. It's a titanium case. Yeah, enamel dial it's got a little bit of everything that you want and it just looks it's so cool with the with the fusée chain on the, on the side of it um i i don't it's just it's amazing it's just so cool and then romain's such a nice guy and and that's that's part of it right these in in today's world i think with watch collecting there's just there's so many things that have gotten overhyped you go into a boutique you can't buy anything there's yeah. nothing available for nothing sale and and you know when i think about these as pieces of art you know, people collect art as well because they want to have a connection with the artist and they want to go to the shows and they want to actually talk with the artists themselves and build a relationship and those are things that you can't do anymore with the patex and the rolexes and the ap's like i don't know maybe 30 years ago you could do that yeah. when they were small brands but now with all the hype and the secondary market and, and the amount of money that's at stake, um, I feel like all that has been lost, but you still get it with brands like Romain Gauthier where, you know, when Romain's in town and he comes for a watch event, I can go to dinner with him and we can talk about watches and he can explain to me how he came up with the design for this watch. And that is just lost in the big brands that have gone and sold to Richemont and, and Swatch. And again, listen, these are businesses. They have to make money and they're shareholders, but, but there's something to be said, I think, about, about the independence and, and why they're able to do such cool stuff because they don't have shareholders. They don't have to worry about profit margins. Yeah. They're doing things that they love um, you know, same thing with Recep from Acrivia, just the coolest stuff in the world. And I hope that most of these guys are able to remain independent. And I know it's hard to do that. I mean, even Jorn had to sell a piece to, to Chanel, right? It, it happens at a, at a certain point, you, there, you have early investors that need to get paid back and, and I get all that. Um, but to the extent that these guys can remain independent and build cool watches like this that don't have to be they don't have to take into account the cost and what the profit margin is going to be and how many units you're going to have to sell to make shareholders happy if you can avoid all of that that's where you have the best stuff and it, it's the same thing with big companies and startups the reason startups do the best work in the world is because they don't have to deal with bureaucracy and red tape yeah. and all this bullshit. they just are full steam ahead and they build cool products to me, that's what independent watch brands are. They're startups that get to build uh, the coolest things in the world, and you know, hope. And we're we're the lucky ones that get to get to play with stuff like this. Amazing. You're completely right. Uh, that's why I also am very drawn to independence because of the design. Like you said, they 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 create the things 
not for making money at the beginning, right. but just because they dreamt about that design or they, they, had, they were inspired by a certain product or a certain landscape or building or whatever. And they just pushed the limits and they found like, thankfully they found like great people like yourself who support their dreams as well. So they can build the next crazy, crazy spaceship. Yeah, you know, I, I posted on Instagram maybe about a month ago about a brand called Lane Watches, yes. right? This guy, Torsty Lane. Yeah. I didn't know anything about him. I saw a picture on Instagram from Red Bar. Somebody had brought a Lane watch and I go, that's really cool. I wonder what that is. And, and then, so I Google him, I see some of his stuff on Instagram and I'm like, oh, this must be a thirty, forty thousand $40,000 watch. Shit, like, man, that's expensive. So then I go to his website, 5,900 Swiss francs for a fully yep. custom built watch. The <laughs> color of dial you want, the type of hands you want, the type of numerals you want. And so I was like, wow, at this price point, this guy's able to give me this? This is a no brainer. And so I went on Instagram, I said, hey, I, I wanna do a group buy. Does anybody wanna buy in to this cool brand? I got about 25 people who responded immediately. At the end, five guys agreed. Yeah. And so basically five or six of us went to Torsty and we did a group buy for, for five unique watches and we're going to get delivery in, in hopefully in about six weeks time. Amazing. I'm going to be super excited to share that with, uh, yeah. with the Instagram community. But like to me, and I was explaining to guys, they were like, oh, why are you, why are you buying this watch? And I said, well, look, first of all, at the price point, what you're getting is amazing. Yeah. On top of that, I said, look, this guy makes 20 watches a year at $5,000, $6,000. So his entire business is like $120,000. If we buy five watches from him, we have materially changed yeah. his business for this. Like we've increased his business yeah, by yeah. 20%. What other brand on earth, yeah. anywhere, can you say that you're gonna change their business by 20% and have an impact on their life? Yes. Nothing. And this guy, he's a self-taught mm -hmm. sort of watchmaker. In his late 30s, he learned how to make watches, won, a, won an award from Langa, and now he's basically started making his own watches. To me, it's about supporting guys like that that are doing the coolest things. Um, not because they're trying to make tens of millions of dollars. The guy's making a couple hundred grand a year, but he's doing what he loves, and that's, that's cool to me. That's what counts even more, maybe, you know? Absolutely. At the end, be, be, be happy with what you do with your life. Amazing. So, Vas, what's let's say the the watch you'll be wearing the the most lately? Or what well, there's there's here? two things I'll talk about. One is you know as far as finding really cool vintage watches go, I found this in Italy a few years ago. You know, given that the the Zenith was my first ever watch, yeah. uh, but it was a modern piece. You know, it all started from the El Primero A386, yeah. and so I managed to find original box. Just, just smell this. You can still <laughs> smell 1969 yes. in it. It literally smells like it did, I think, I believe at it least is, from the is. day the guy first bought this watch. Original punched papers from Milan. May 31st, 1973 in there. How cool is that, right? And then you've got sort of one of, if not the greatest vintage chronograph ever made with the original ladder bracelet original clasp um, and it's just an, it's an unbelievable condition. Oh, I mean, it's beautiful. And the bracelet's super cool, huh? It's so Those cool. Ga gaps in between. It's so cool. Probably comfy as well for the summer. And the fact that it comes with the box and uh, the papers. Uh, I mean, it's, so it's nuts. We know the owner was a uh, Luigi. Had, <laughs> yeah. Definitely had good taste. <laughs> beautiful, oh, amazing. And so, yeah, in, in terms of the watch that I'm probably spending the most time wearing, um, and if you ask me if there's one watch, I mean, look, over, over the course of my five to seven years now being a collector, a lot of watches have come in. I wore them for a year, for two years, you get bored. Yeah. Or, you know, I don't have unlimited money. You gotta, you gotta sometimes sell something to buy something else. And so I have gone through a lot of stuff that's come in. It's gone out the door. I've got new stuff and this cycle is going to continue. You know, if you, if you told me, uh, if you asked me, am I going to have every one of these watches in even five years time? I'd say, I don't know. I think there's a few special pieces yeah. here that I'm never going to get rid of. But yeah, the other stuff, if something newer comes along from the brand that I think is really cool, 
yeah, I'd, I'd probably get rid of something here and put that money towards getting something else. But if there's one watch that I say from now to, to the day I die and hopefully they bury me in it, what is that watch gonna be? <laughs> to me, it's the 5170P from, from Patek. Um, and, that, and that's probably what I spend a lot of time wearing now. I think the, the dial on this thing is just, it's unreal. It is, it is the best dial that Patek has ever made in my, in my opinion. And then the fact that they were able, and I didn't even realize this when I first found out about this watch, the fact that all the indices are diamond baguettes yeah. is just bonkers to me. Because uh, I would never ever wear a watch with any bling on it, nothing. No rainbow Daytona, yeah. none of that nonsense. I can't do it, I won't do it. But to have found a watch that was able to integrate diamonds so subtly into the dial that nobody knows until I tell them and point it out, I think is amazing. And then, you know, the Patek chrono movements yes. are just bonkers. Yeah. It's a 39 millimeters. I believe 39 is the perfect size for a normal sized human being, not for the big boys. You know, you're a little bit of a big boy. You can, yeah. you can pull off some, <laughs> some 44s and 46s. <laughs> yeah. But for me and for other normal human beings, 39, I believe for men is the perfect size. And that's what this is. And so to me, this is the watch that I will, I will never ever sell. Let's say that's the one. That's the one. <laughs> no, but I can see why. Like you said, the movement of a Patek chronograph. I mean. It's for me, the watch always starts with the dial. Um, yeah. I know there's some people who care about the movement more than they care about the dial. I know there's people who care about the case sometimes more than anything else. For me, it's all about the dial. If the dial is not spectacular and special, then I can't buy that watch. And so I oftentimes don't care if there's an independent brand that doesn't have an in-house movement. I don't care. If you take an ETA movement and you're gonna refinish it yeah. and you're gonna modify it and put in your own bridges and skeleton, cool, man, that's awesome. As long as your dial is something unique yeah. and something that you make or that you at least designed yourself, then I'm, then I'm cool with it. And, and so, you know, and, and you probably see that in everything that I bought. Not all of these guys make their own in-house movements. Most of them do, but, but a lot of the stuff that I've bought, including someone like Lane, you know, at that price point of, of $5,000, you can't expect someone to make their own in-house movement. So they have to sort of modify an existing movement. And I have no problem with that as long as the dial side is, is awesome. And, and so, you know, when you, when you talk about the, the Langa chronographs out there, and you talk about a lot of other brands that have amazing chronographs, and even Patek, you've got the, the 5170G, you've got the 57, you've got all of those amazing chronos. At the end of the day, this is the one I always come back to. I think this is the best dial they've ever made. Listen, Abbas, thank you so much for having us here. So we can share this amazing collection with our audience. I know they will love it for sure. And check out NYC Watch Card Instagram. He has uh, very funny memes there. Listen, if we're gonna spend all this money and time, we gotta at least have fun with it. Let's, exactly. not, let's not take the hobby so seriously. Exactly, so thank you for having us. Thanks for coming guys. by. See you next time.